You can be seated. It's a little story of two uh, schoolboys. One is a, a good Catholic boy, and the other is a good Muslim boy. And they were talking about their uh, religions, and the Catholic boy said, My priest knows more than your Allah. To which the Muslim boy responded, Well, of course he does. You tell him everything. <laughs> I think it's actually a good thing when two little boys can tease each other good-naturedly about their religions. In our increasingly pluralistic culture, we're seeing more dialogue and understanding between different faiths. Within our own parish boundaries, we're seeing more folks move into the neighborhood uh, from different nationalities and languages. I was told just recently that at Wedgwood School, where uh, where the kids have just started, that one-third of the students there speak English as a second language. Another language is being spoken at home. And I think that on the whole, we, we can benefit from such diversity. We can learn from different cultures. We are exposing ourselves to different points of view, and that can help us to learn not only about others, but can also help us to learn more about ourselves, and maybe even sometimes expose our own prejudices and presuppos presuppositions. For, for truly being honest, we must admit that much of the time uh, we struggle to be inclusive, much of the time we're guilty of exclusivism. We worry little for Aboriginal people living on reserves in third world conditions without even clean drinking water because we like to think that it's well, their fault and they refuse to assimilate to our culture. Our government has utilized fear time and again as a tactic to convince us to fight more wars and to close our borders. We spread fear of Islam to justify our resistance to welcoming refugees for looking for help. We make snap judgments about people based on their occupation, marital status, sexuality, and ethnicity. And we even spend vast amounts of energy in the church arguing over doctrine, worship preferences, and most often feel great angst when it might seem that our needs or opinions aren't being prioritized. Well, today we are confronted with a challenging reading from the Gospel of Mark. It begins with St. John telling Jesus about the disciples' efforts to prevent an individual from performing exorcisms on the basis of him not following us. Interesting that earlier in the Gospel, the disciples uh, return from a venture where they attempted to perform an exorcism and weren't able to do so just a few pages earlier. And so we can almost detect maybe a little bit of jealousy or certainly at least a whiny tone in the words of the disciples. Perhaps they're worried. They're worried that someone might be stealing their thunder as if their mission might somehow be co-opted by others. Or perhaps they were just worried about losing their place and influence to the newest, hottest trends. Well, in any event, Jesus offers a corrective to his tiny band of followers, pointing out that whoever is not against us is for us. If someone is doing a deed of power in Jesus' name, then that person isn't likely to start turning on Jesus later or denying him. Jesus is trying to help his disciples to understand that they didn't have the patent on the supernatural, nor were they able to dictate who belonged to Jesus. Their Lord was always trying to expand the circle, to draw others in to the community of faith rather than shutting them out. But like most of us, the disciples weren't really all that keen at sharing their privileged place with others. Jesus then goes on to warn, to warn those, possibly the disciples, who would place a stumbling block on the little ones, on those who were seeking Jesus, those who were becoming his disciples. And I've often had difficulty with this passage, and particularly the lines that follow. Because it seems like Jesus is giving license to extreme asceticism or, or even self-mutilation. 
And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. But I think if we read it in the context of the first part of our story today, I think we might see it as a reminder that we must let go of parts of ourselves in order to, ironically, become whole. But sometimes it is in cutting off a part of ourselves that we find wholeness. Jesus, after all, once said, he who loses his life will save it. It's sort of full of these paradoxes. It's better to lose those parts of ourselves that impede us from being most authentically human, the way that God intends us to be. So then the question becomes, well, what are those things that we need to let go of in our lives? Self-interest, arrogance, fear, guilt, ego. I've often spoken how spiritual writer Henry Nouwen was impacted by his time at L'Arche, the community north of the city, where he and other volunteers commit to living and serving alongside severely disabled people. And it was there, amongst many people without use of their limbs, that Nouwen truly felt most whole. And he learned what it meant to, to be whole from those with a very limited ability. And he always said that he received more from those he served than what he was able to give. And he finally found peace and fulfillment that had always eluded him in a competitive academic culture. Have you ever had an experience like that? Where you've given up something, time, money, preference, energy, for someone, and actually found yourself happier and more fulfilled? Can you think of concrete examples of how putting others' needs first actually resulted in you having deeper needs met? I'm sure we can all think of examples, perhaps in parenting or assisting a coworker, or even seeking to make others comfortable at church by not mentioning that they're sitting in your pew. <laughs> or insisting that things go your way. It's hard for us to live like this consistently, isn't it? I mean, I know it is for me. And part of that is because we live in a society that praises those who pursue their dreams, their interests, their concerns at all costs. Workplaces don't often consider the demands they put on their employees that have great detriment to their families. Businesses treat us like soulless consumers. And governments make decisions based more on self-interest than on the needs or desires of the people they are to serve. But as disciples of Christ, we must listen to Christ's urgings. Not to lose our distinctive way of life that runs contrary to much of the dominant ideology in our culture. Jesus warns his friends and all of us, salt is good. But if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Salt is an image Jesus uses a great deal in his teachings to talk about his disciples, about having flavor, about being distinct. He's urging them not to succumb to the pressures to adopt the standards and ethos of the dominant social structure. If the saltiness is gone, then so is the salt's capacity to season. Only in maintaining their uniqueness as followers of the suffering Son of Man will the disciples be able to influence the surrounding culture. It is by no means an easy assignment, either for the original disciples or for later ones, but it is precisely what we are called for, not privilege, but service. What would happen if we spread Christ's message of inclusivity, consistently putting the needs of others ahead of our own? Wouldn't the church be changed? Wouldn't we be seen as those practicing what we preach instead of hypocrites that can't seem to ever get along? What would it do to our political landscape if Canadians across this land stood up for the rights of others? Politicians do the same. 
And what would our neighborhoods look like if we all took time to notice what's going on in the lives of those around us? Wouldn't it make for a better place and a people more in line with the pattern of Christ's life and admonition? Cast in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Amen.